Warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. And welcome to Hazardous Materials, last week's comics this week, where we talk a little bit about last week's comics this week. Get you caught up before the new releases for this week, and we also sprinkle in a little bit of media news at the end. My name's Casey Johnson, with me as always. And Gideon Gonzalez. How was your turkey day? Mine was quite good. How was yours? We totally skipped on this whole show doing it, didn't we? <laughs> yes. You... <laughs> Eagle-eared vi- viewers might realize that uh, there was not an episode last week. We were not, in fact, canceled. We were just stuffing ourselves with excessive foods. I mean, specifically, I was surviving a Black Friday shift. But <laughs> Oh, God, that's right. You were. Yes. I felt so bad for you hearing it about that. It wasn't as bad as I expected, which really? is the nice thing. Yeah. You were not besieged by... Yeah, it was It was busy, but it wasn't like, ugh, busy. Oh, God, I, I do not miss Black Friday. I used to work for Apple, and that, oh. that was the kind of Black Friday where they would actually... Before the store opens, they would get everybody on the floor and like they would prepare for war. <laughs> it's like you here, you here, you here. Hold the front line. I'm like oh, everyone hell. put on your pugilist masks. Exactly. Remember your training and you will survive. <laughs> so uh, in light of us missing last week, we will skim through a few of two weeks ago's. But like, well, when our viewers listen, it'll be two weeks ago's books. Mm-hmm. Just the good stuff. really. Exactly. So uh, obviously we got to cover the the X books, New Mutants and X Force. Yeah, and, you know we were talking a little bit about this, the fact that we pretty much have ended up covering all the X books. Yeah, but we've come to a consensus on something. Don't care for Fallen Angels. Fallen Angels sucks. We're not going to cover that anymore. <laughs> I, I like I like Brian Hill. I like Simon Kadransky, but the book's just not working. For it's me. just garbage, and it's going on hiatus, hiatus on issue six. And I'll be surprised if it comes back. I'm, I also would. Yeah, but I just I, don't think it's working. I, I also get Brian Hill just walking away with it because he's got he, he getting that TV money. Yeah, but we he, are hearing about another book that may very well replace it. And we'll talk about that in our yes, new sector. But before we get started, uh, we're going to look into New Mutants number two. Yeah, more fun space stuff. I love it. Happy to see my boy Cannonball back. And 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 sporting the uh, non-dad body that <laughs> yeah. uh, Sunspot thought he was going to be in. And we get the... Uh, what the kind of plot hook of the book is, which it's bringing back uh, Zandra, who is Xavier and Leandra's daughter. Mm-hmm. She isn't currently acting queen of the Shi'ar Empire, but much of the royal guard is kind of conspiring against her. And we see brought in her aunt Deathbird. Yeah. Now, see, this. there's something about this book and this. Oh, God. Um there was a time during uh, the Avengers, I think it was like, what, the U.S. Avengers or something like that? Where yeah, Sunspot US, and Campbell. U.S. Avengers. <laughs> yeah, well, Sunspot and Campbell are both in the same book. I read it a couple of times. I didn't like what they were doing with Sunspot. I checked out. Mm-hmm. Apparently, me checking out, I missed a big plot point, which is Cannonball marrying Smasher, Smasher yeah. from the Imperial Guard. I'm mm-hmm. like, That's where Smasher's been this whole time because she was an Avenger. Smash and Cannonball. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> smash or smash uh but yeah i i didn't know they got married i didn't even know they were interested in each other yeah. but uh, apparently that's a thing and they've got a kid so um i'm glad that they got that fixed up but i'm still wondering where's magma where's, where's magma i think she's popping up in one of the books coming up I yeah th- i know she's i want to say she's popping up in x-men i think she might be showing up in new mutant soon because she's definitely a well yeah it's She's definitely showing up in X Men in like number seven or eight, and I think she might be popping up A-O-L. in AOL. AOL. A W O L. Oh, jeez, I caught that. She's definitely get, America Online. You get your free internet CD. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your fifty minutes. There's apparently a collector's uh, community around AOL discs. That's amazing. It uh, blows my uh, mind. Uh, I, I found sh- out about this. It's apparently like <laughs> rare discs to find. Oh, that's fun. Who knew? Having thrown out many of those as a child. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, what are your thoughts on how they're characterizing our boys now? I really enjoying it. I like, really am. It's a ton of fun. I really like seeing them be young adults. Although yeah. my biggest issue with it, cause it's fun seeing your favorite disaster teens become disaster young adults. Like, it, cause they're like in their all in their like early mid twenties now. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. But, uh, right. I don't like that it's still called New Mutants. I wish they had a better name for the team because it feels disingenuous as hell to have a book called New Mutants starring characters from 30 years ago. And that's true. I get that. Uh, but that's just the title that stuck with them. And yeah. 
And you know, it's 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 got that nostalgia ring to it. I don't yeah. think they're really so much the new mutants as in they are the team called New Mutants. Which is still kind of lame, I think. I don't know. They, I, I'm all about I, it. I wish they had a different name. If they were uh, like... Well, let's see, they tried the new name. They made X-Force. You see yeah, where that went. that's true. Honestly, like, they're, they can think of something. They got so many words they can slap an X in front of. I think that no matter what they come up with, they're not going to be able to Actually, sell the no, books and New Mutants You would. know what the book should be called? Hmm. X-Men. I don't think so. They should be the new X-Men. Uh-uh. Because there is already a new X-Men. If you say new X-Men, you do a search for new X-Men, you're going to get an entirely different team. Yeah, the best X-Men book. Uh, oh, that book. <laughs> no, I was not a fan of non-costumed X-Men. Oh, that book rules. It's the it's the best X-Men looks. Yeah, even the way they did Magneto? You mean... <laughs> you mean I, hardcore mode? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I I like that arc. I have some issues with it, mm-hmm. but it's such a good twist. Uh, oh, I, I love, don't know. And my boy Zorn, I love the continuity black hole that is Zorn. He really is. It, 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 I'm I'm never really sure what I'm dealing with when Zorn's in a book. I was very sad when uh, Hawks and Pox ended their streak of Zorn appearing in every issue because I think we got like a good seven or eight issues in before Zorn stopped being an, at least a cameo in every issue. And there's like two Zorns, so I'm really not sure which Zorn I'm dealing with in any given book. Because uh, I think Zorn with an X is the like traditional looking one and like the new X-Men jacket. I think Zorn with a Z is the one like the flaming head. No. So which, which one's the Zen one? Uh, That's the X, X jacket, right? Yeah. The Okay. Because like Zorn is the... Because there's supposed to be like a yin yang and Zorn is like the black hole and Zorn so with a Z the is Zorn the Zorn that was in the very uh, first of the Hickman uh, X-Men. The one that, that, that uh, God, was, or was he in it? Or am I having old man memory issues? I think he might be having old man memory issues. I'm having old man memory issues. But let's move on. We're spending yes. too much time on New Mutants. Uh, X-Force number two. Yep. Uh, built off the stuff in the first issue. I'm glad I stuck around. Mm-hmm. Was, I was kind of lukewarm on it, but I'm really liking where the book's going now. That's exactly how I felt about it. Um, I, I, I like that this is actually keeping up the energy. Yeah. Um, I've always been disappointed with X-Force books in the past. They'll have like a really great concept. It's like, hey, check us out. Look at this run. And then everything is just... Yeah, I loved Uncanny X Force. Really wanted to love the Humphreys and uh, Chris Anka X Force run, but it just wasn't there. Because that's such a good lineup. You had Puck, Storm, Spiral, like all characters I really like. I like the Weapon X Force. I was my favorite. Didn't read that one. Yes, I mean it wasn't officially an X Force book, but it was like this is. We we know what what you want. Yeah, in in universe, it was Weapon X Force. Yeah, indeed, it was just Weapon X. Uh, Yeah. Oh, where's the other X Force? I like Slice Barrier's X Force. That was a fun, weird one. Which one's that? That was the one that came after, I think, uh, Humphrey's Uncanny X Force. That one had uh, Cable, Marrow, Dr. Nemesis. I love any book that has Dr. Nemesis in it. It involves uh, Cable repeatedly killing himself by dunking himself into a pit of sharks. So, great book. I, I must have missed that. He's got like a virus thing in him that where you're like it keeps degrading, de- uh, eroding his body. So he keeps having to kill himself and regenerate from a new body. How strange. It's a really weird, fun book. What uh, was that weird book that Dr. Nemesis was in with Beast? Uh, X Club. X Club. That I was would a, love an ongoing X Club. X Club was great. That was Matt F- during Matt Fraction's run on X-Men and he also wrote that. It's a nice little five issue miniseries. Uh, and Dr. Nemesis, if you if you don't know, is like a super old school Marvel character. They've since turned into a mutant. And he's so god awful sarcastic. Imagine if it's gold. Yeah. Imagine if Krieger from Archer was a superhero. Yes. He's just this over the top mad scientist. He has a shark gun. It's yes. a gun that shoots sharks. OK, now that we're talking about Nemesis, you got to see this is this is our boy, Dr. Nemesis here. Um, anything you find him in, read it. Uh, I, I wish I could just do a whole show just talking about how cool Dr. Nemesis is. I think he's popped up in a couple issues of the Hawks and Pox era. Just yeah. really quickly. But. I saw him in um, in a background yeah. of the post oh, actually in, in X-Force. Oh, this right. X-Force. Uh, he was in the background of the first page. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the first and only time I've ever seen him. Yeah. And we actually get a really good group shot of mutants in there because my boy strong guys in there. Yeah, I know. I'm glad to see the strong guys uh, evaded the clutches of uh, uh, infernal leadership. Yeah. And he was uh, he was on like the character select screen that Hickman showed when they were revealing all of the books for this line. 
And so I'm glad to see him still around. Now you brought this up. There is something about this crowd that I seem that it's kind of bugging me. And it seems extremely out of character. Okay. Everybody's looking at poor uh, Professor X on the ground. You know, the helmet's off. It mm-hmm. really is Professor X. Everybody's got kind of a dour look on her face. One person is face palming in utter despair. And it's Feral. Huh. Why? Oh, Feral was it? I didn't even notice Feral. She's was right in the background, front and center doing this. The last thing, geez, the last thing I remember Feral being in was that weird issue of X Factor where Rain was just hallucinating her. Yeah. But oh. she's she's her, and apparently, I guess this is very the, sad. This this I guess this goes back to the idea that almost everybody on the island that he's either dead or close to being dead mm-hmm. or whatever has been brought back as the better version of themselves. Yeah. So is this like the better version of Feral? Because is there a better version of Feral? Because Feral, by and large, was a piece of shit character. Yeah, it was kind of just like, hey, let's take Wolfsbane and make her boring. Yeah, when I see. Piece of shit character. I don't mean that the, the the quality of her construction was poor, although Liefeld had his hand in it. So yes. it was poor. But once Liefeld has hand off of it and it was in the different writers and other, they basically made her evil. Yeah. Yeah. She just flat out selfish, murderous character that they eventually had to kill off like twice. So <laughs> she far. was too bad. They've killed her twice. I think the bones of the character is bad. I mean, she's already kind of redundant. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I I don't think I've ever been like, oh, cool. Feral's in this. Most recent time I saw Feral, she was being eaten uh, by a saber tooth clone. Oh. And that was pretty gruesome. It's pretty, pretty That's gross. That's a pretty gruesome way to go. And it kind of reminds me of what Blob did to Wasp uh, in the Ultimate Universe. God. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That was so awful. Uh, Ultimate was really awful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't don't get me started on the ultimate universe. I I was very invested in it, and then ultimatum happened and killed all my hopes and dreams. It really did, and, it, and brutally so yeah. in some fashions. So um, so what else we got going? We got this weird weird FF book. Go and bring that little guy up there. He's that, that thick thick monster FF book. That's not it. Oh, no, that's not it. That's that's. I didn't I didn't bring it with me, but oh yeah, I didn't bring any last week's. That's books. what I'm pointing at is the monster monster New Year's Evil book, which we'll which, get to, which you damn near killed me. And I'm gonna go in depth <laughs> on it because I love that book. But anyways, FF Grand Design, uh, it's Tom Scioli kind of doing what Ed Pisker did with the X Men, but with uh, Kirby and Lee's Fantastic Four run. He condenses 100 issues of Silver Age comics into two gigantic, very, very dense issues. Very dense. Going in chronological order through the events. So the beginning of issue one is uh, the Watcher saving Galactus at the end of the prior universe. So what we're talking about here is your typical comic book is uh, on the average nine frames. Sometimes four frames if you're trying to go big or, you know, the gatefold. Um, this book is so dense. I, I'd have to say there's like 20 frames of a book. There's a at page. least there's there are multiple 36 panel pages yes. in it. And the frames are that freaking yeah. big. Tom Scioli, I, I've described it as a side of a toy box style art mm-hmm. where like you see a little comic on the side of an of an action figure box. Because he packs just so much little story and he's got that really cool classic looking art style. And man, it works with FF and he makes I, it so fun. I did not know what I was getting into when I opened this book. It I is, didn't realize what it was. Yeah. And I was like, this seems really strange. They are very, very stylish info dump comics. And that's not like that's not a negative thing. That's it's the the the. the the fact that they're able to essentially make summaries so entertaining and cool and unique is amazing. Like it's so that that was that was what it kind of weird because I saw things that that was like okay, look, there's the birth of Franklin Richards mm-hmm. over three frames, three tiny frames is basically Franklin Richards being born, but then somewhere in the middle of the book we get Panther Voltron. Yeah, so about midway through it though. Uh, Ed Pisker's uh, X-Men Grand Design is kind of a similar thing where the last like 10 pages or so are just original content of him tying things up from Claremont's run. Mm-hmm. This one is Tom Scioli's being like, what kind of would have happened had Kirby stayed on the book for a bit longer? Panther and it Voltron. Gets, yeah, it gets wild. There's <laughs> Voltron Panther. There is Reed Richards, Herald of Galactus. <laughs> There is, and this is the the craziest thing actually why I wanted to talk about the issue because it I was just like, holy shit. So Franklin is not Reed's kid in it. Franklin Sue reveals that he's Namor's child, and that's why Franklin is a mutant. 
scandalous. I was like, oh my God. That is scandalous. That it, was, it was such a wild, unexpected thing to read. And I was like, that's really, really damn cool. But yes, that that's a that is a deep wound. Yeah, that was like, <laughs> that is brutal as hell. So where did that go from there? Um, I mean, it's a part of the reason why Reed becomes Herald of Galactus in it. Uh, you've got all the heroes fighting against Galactus. Uh, Franklin kind of coming to terms with being a mutant. It's a really cool read. If you like the Fantastic Four and you want to see an interesting alternative take on the most def- arguably one of the most definitive comic runs of all time, highly recommend it. Now, see, I didn't get a chance to actually read through that, nor did I get through uh, Nears Evil just because they were so dense. Uh, it's, it's because I usually have about like, two or three hours to read all of this right before we record. And that was just way too much mm-hmm. to really take in. And I, and I really want to absorb these tomes yeah. is what they are. So I'm going to have to do that in my own leisure. But moving on, uh, we continue our our Hellblazer coverage with yet another number one. Yeah. So explain I, to me what happened here. So they did a one shot of John Constantine Hellblazer by Cy Spurrier and Aaron Campbell. Mm-hmm. And now they're doing the ongoing number one. <laughs> Why couldn't is- they just done one and shoot drives me insane i hate 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 when they do that the double dipping on the number ones yeah because it confuses people it does i I saw it it's like oh hellblaze no one i already read that i'm not gonna read that you had to tell me it was a different book before i read it and it's it's still really good still great i love uh I, i like the opening sequence with john at the bar meeting the bouncer that was really fun and uh we're kind of speeding through this one, but I love the end bit of a uh, Boris Johnson at a sex cult. Great I, stuff. I like the fact that they're continuing the trend of uh, John Constantine screwing over friends. Yes, as as it should be. As the, the guy says, you told me that, 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 that this scab on my face would heal 15 years <laughs> and it's worse. <laughs> John Constantine is the worst and he should always be the worst. I liked I liked the bouncer. I yes, have to say I like Bouncer's the a great character. I like to see her kind of become the new Chaz. But on the other hand, I like her and don't want her to get probably killed by John Constantine. Yeah, what is her name? I'm trying to remember. I don't have a copy with it on me, but I know that the way they introduce themselves. Yeah, it's like you know, hi, I'm such and such. Hi, I'm John. I'll not fuck you, John. <laughs> okay. Wasn't really thinking that. Right, right, right. I, I see the loneliness in your face. I know you're a collector of people. <laughs> and that's that's a damn good description of John Constantine. Yes. He just gets, he hangs on and then he usually winds up selling people to the devil. Indeed. So this pretty much concludes our missing week. Yes. Uh, now we're going to dip into our fresh stuff, starting off with the newest Batman. We're part 10 in the City of Bane yes. storyline. And we get a little explanation as to how uh, how Thomas is here. And that's been my biggest issue with King's Run. I've I've really enjoyed it, but I've always been like, ah, I hate that they brought Thomas Wayne back and doesn't make any sense. Groom, groom, groom. This issue reveals that at the end of the button, uh, Professor Zoom in a last act of pettiness right before the flashpoint timeline disappeared, grabs Thomas Wayne and drops him in the main DC universe and is like, hey, you killed me. So now you have to live in a world where your son is you. Worst thing you could have expected. And that's Bye. That, that, that is part and parcel for the, the, the reverse flash because he is a petty bitch. Yes. And that's what I love about him. <laughs> he is ah, it's a meddling cruel guy yes so now needlessly cruel like in uh when he (laughs) that in flash rebirth he revealed hey barry every bad thing that ever happened to you was my fault that time you tripped down some stairs as a kid it was me when the gate was left open your dog walked into the street it was me he's a horrible person so we find out that uh as far as thomas wayne is concerned the bad is all him and Mm -hmm. his son has basically become him and he's he, the originator of this thing. And he hates that. Yeah. And it's, he told Martha that, that their son is alive and has become this. And she immediately killed herself. Yeah. As seen in uh, the Flashpoint Batman miniseries. Yeah. I like how this issue is told chronologically backwards. Mm-hmm. And so it shows you how he's reached this point. I keep saying earlier and earlier yeah. and earlier. I was like, damn. I really liked him having uh, Selena Kyle, uh, the Flashpoint universe, Selena Kyle as a sidekick. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really cool. Um, I really liked their mirroring the classic Bruce Wayne, like swearing to war on crime, but with Thomas Wayne as an adult, like putting 
Bruce to bed and like swearing to end all forces that would harm him. Yeah. So it seems like all of Gotham's big main villains are getting methodically picked off. Yeah. Including poor Kite Man. Well, Flashpoint Universe Kite Man. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. I really like this. Like, yeah, that police are like, oh, that's cool. All these all these major criminals are getting shot. And that's just Flashpoint Batman. Guy, yeah. guy carries a couple guns. And then it ends with uh, basically his ultimatum of he's been doing he's been doing all of these plans throughout the entire Tom King run because he wants Bruce to stop being Batman. Like, that's kind do of. You, do you think he saved Joker? Oh, yeah. You think, you know, like, yeah, like our Joker. Yeah, definitely. OK, I was wondering if that was like some kind of like alternate universe. No, no, that that was fr- that was from uh like number 49, I think, was the Joker two parter right before the wedding. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, because see, it has, I'm not really much of a Batman reader. It's mm-hmm. kind of hard for me to pick where these things are occurring. Yeah, because uh, a lot of it is like basically most of the probably the first half of the issue is all callbacks to earlier scenes from Tom King's run. And then it goes back into like the Flashpoint stuff. And that's mostly new content. Oh, OK, well, then. Yeah, Oh, well, there's that. And it's an excellent issue that sold me on Thomas Wayne as a Batman villain, which has been the biggest hurdle that I could not get over for this entire series. And that's, that's basically what's going down is that they're facing off against each other at the very mm-hmm. end of this. And it's, it's about to go downtown. And uh, I've got to give a shout out to Jorge Fornes, who is probably my favorite artist on this run. Very, very Mazzucchelli inspired. Um, there's a sequence that's directly homaging Frank Miller's Daredevil 191, which is the Russian roulette issue and one of my favorite single issues of all time. It's a scene where he's uh, that was me actually searching my brain going 191. It's him. <laughs> he squared off with Selena. This is before he takes her under his wing mm-hmm. and they do like the panel from uh, that issue where it's Daredevil holding the trigger and like the slow. Oh, um, yeah. Really, really cool. I love that touch. Uh, yes. Right after the Frank Miller stuff. Exactly. And then uh, so we're going to move in to Green Lantern Black Stars number two, a.k.a. Wow. Grant Morrison Zermanico slam dunk the DC universe. <laughs> it was wow. Uh, he described it as a good natured roast before it came out, but it's a pretty like damning yes i mean there's a lot of it where like superman goes on this big long diatribe it's like no matter what we do it's always this new armageddon we've got to deal with we're constantly dealing with the invasions of this of the, the depressoverse <laughs> as someone who thinks the dark multiverse is really stupid that i got a good chuckle out of that i'm uh, i'm i'm never gonna get over that stupid scene in metal where they have the map of the multiverse from multiversity and like, but there's a dark multiverse and they physically turn the map around and it's all black on the other side. <laughs> that was the <laughs> hackiest nonsense I've ever read. So the depresso verse, just the fact that that exists was hilarious to me. Um, and he goes on this long diatribe about, you know, no matter what we do, we're constantly being besieged by a variety of crazy shit. Of increasingly cosmic and increasingly anthropomorphic. <laughs> yes. And then he goes, and this... What's this? It, it feels like this is. What are you talking about? This? It's like we're in frozen video, but the audio just keeps going. Audio? What are you talking about? Yes, audio. It's a great little parody <laughs> of Bendis speak. Yeah, there's uh, there there's some shade thrown at Tom King's Batman. A lot of it seems to be mostly Morrison, like kind of calling out other writers for using recycling themes that he had done just a decade earlier. Mm-hmm. And uh it seemed like this book was so severely over the top. Yes. I mean, I I, I only got to read like part of part mm-hmm. one, like the first four pages that I had to check out. But I got to fully invest in this issue and just have to absorb what I've got sitting in front of me. And yeah. it was nuts. I Oh, the, the Isla Beth's backstory with how she murdered her former husband was great. It's like they, they merged something. Uh, they, they turned classic. Romanian vampires, <laughs> even to the point where they had uh, Vlad Tapies marrying yeah. them off. I thought that was a nice touch. <laughs> the vampires from what uh, what we do in the shadows are also in the wedding party. Yeah. As in Cassidy is in the front row. I didn't catch that. Yeah, you can see like half of his face. But you clearly see like the blonde hair and the sunglasses. Oh, those are distinctive sunglasses. And apparently these are the sun eaters. Yeah. You were, oh, my God. I forgot about that. That was so good. Such a good tie into Morrison's other work. Yeah. Is that the vampires grow up into sun eaters. 
Yeah, like, that's oh, like, that's like so what, cool. I was like, wonder where they're going with this. And it's like, you know, on the, 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 this this vampire who's apparently a member of the Black Stars and is wanting to get married with Hal Jordan. Beazel Beth. Yeah. And she's talking about her previous husband, who she married as a child bride when she was only 400 years old. And he was like, like 1,200, yeah. 12,000 years old. 12,000, yeah. And all he was was just a lustful cloud of flaying flesh <laughs> on and, their a wedding night. And apparently the... Uh, he the ritual me. to to turn into a sun eater involves being put in. They call it like a wooden cocoon, but it's it's a casket, mm-hmm. and then being shot into a sun to devour it. And she kills him by putting him into much too big of a sun, so yeah. he just burns alive. It's like imagine an ant trying to eat an elephant. <laughs> And the funny thing is, like, after, after 12,000 years, my, my husband has surmised that one five uh, word sentence surmises everything you could possibly say to anybody. And is that my appetite knows no bounds. That's the answer to everything. <laughs> so that's all he ever says. And where it ties into the book itself is that Beazelbeth is wanting to ascend to a sun eater. And as a gift, she wants Earth Sun. It, this almost seems like a comedy book. It, I mean, it really is. Like, I, I did not know that. There's going like in. a two-page slapstick bit of all of Beelzebeth's attempts to kill her husband. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh my God! How did that blessed water get there? Like her, oh my God! Her, like her dog drinks like the, some of the poison. The, the he, garlic water. Yeah. It's the like, garlic oh, water. how did that happen? <laughs> it's oh, it's great. Yeah. I, how did how did this devolve into a comedy book? How'd they slip this in? <laughs> uh, I think it's because Grant Morrison can do whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Uh, and, but this thing. Wow. Wow. And plot, was, plot wise, the big development is the the miracle machine still exists. Like, as a MacGuffin, not yes. in Deus Ex Machina. Not in Deus Ex Machina because it didn't pop out of nowhere. It's nope. been established. And the last remainder of the prior universe before Hal Jordan rewrote everything is Hal's ring. And he's aware of the other universe. Yes. He can. Like he's he, trying to convince everybody else about this existence of the other universe. It's like, ah, oh, that doesn't universe doesn't exist. Yeah. And by the way, we've got this. It's like. Yeah. The only the only <laughs> thing they know of Green Lanterns is that like the last remainder of the f- former universe was a Green Lantern ring. Yeah. And so apparently their their whole the the whole idea behind the Black Stars is that they are the they have the the way of Mu. Mm-hmm. And apparently Mu stretches himself a little too far and dies halfway through this book. Yes. So now they have to lie about his death to propagate his word. Weekend at Moo's. <laughs> exactly. This is what this, this book has devolved into. This is this a three issue series or yes, four? Three it's issues. So, we needed to give Liam Sharp some time to get ahead on the I feel like I want to see what the punchline is going to be in issue three. I'm I'm so excited. I, <laughs> I've been loving this Green Lantern book. I'm loving this little Black Stars side. It's just a ton of fun. So moving right along, we got uh, the tome I was pointing out to yes. earlier. This thick book, New Year's 80 Evil. 80 page giant. 80 page so, giant. There's, it's an anthology from a variety of creators. Uh, it's usually DC does the, D, D, ah, usually DC does these throughout the year for like Valentine's Day, for Halloween. This is our holiday special. Yeah. And so there's a ton, a ton of great stories in here. Normally these things tend to be kind of hit or miss. Wasn't a bad book. Well, be, well not a bad story in this one. What are the highlights? Uh, some of my favorite ones. Uh, a surprisingly touching chrono story by Dave Wheelgoss and Scientori. I'm just making sure I say that name right. Mm-hmm. Where he is constantly attempting to stop what he sees has made him as a villain, which is his shitty dad. And he talks about well, that's cool. Yeah, he's like, I've made 74 attempts to fix my father. Not one of them have worked. And it's just him trying to like give himself as a kid a good Christmas, and it's just really touching. Now, see when I when I think of Kronos, I'm, I'm thinking old school Kronos, white oh, mask, yeah. striped pants, the yellow and green, the and best worst costume. It was like the most hideous costume <laughs> everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you what Kronos used to look like here His in majesties. the 70s and 80s. The clock face mask is my favorite. Oh part my of god! It. I mean, you think it's like yes, I'm going to become a villain, but. I'm going to go all out. Yeah. <laughs> and he has a much more subtle design in this one than his yeah. classic costume. But yeah, just a really, really heartwarming, not heartwarming, just heartstrings tugging story. I highly recommend checking I, it out. I've always enjoyed a good redemption story. My very favorite comic book stories are 
redemption stories. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the reason why most of my favorite characters are villains. And it's not because, ooh, evil, it's so edgy. It's because I love it when they go and do the redemption yeah. story arc. Sinestro gets a really good story in here where he visits a planet that he had saved as a Green Lantern and they now have like a winter holiday in his honor. Mm, that that's was cool. That was really fun. Uh, there's a really good Kenny Parker and Ramon Villa Lo- or Kenny Porter, sorry, and Ramon Villa Lobos uh, Superman story where toy it's mostly toy man focused where he tries to get kids to get rid of their cell phones by doing basically the total justice figures from the (laughs) nineties. But they're like obviously people sized and fight Superman. Of course. So it's like an electric blue Superman, a Kyle Rayner with clip on armor and a Batman with these like purple goggles and tentacles. I remember, and I enjoyed Superman Blue and Superman Red. Oh, and I, I know love you Superman did. Blue. That's I know you did. One of I, the first comic I ever read had Superman Blue in it, so I'm very biased. And they stole the Superman Red outfit and put it on Superwoman. Yeah, I like that. I loved it. They did the similar thing about uh, 15 years before that with Strange Visitor. She was a character that's introduced right around. Oh, I'm trying to remember when that was. It was. Around the time Joe Kelly was on action, mm-hmm. they introduced a character called Strange Visitor, like obviously playing on the Strange Visitor from Another World thing. She was like, an, she had like electric based powers. So they gave her the blue suit. Oh, okay. And then even uh, right before New 52, Livewire started wearing that costume. Well, her outfit, her old outfit always kind of looked like the Superman blue outfit anyway. Yeah, but we're like in black. And so oh, eventually cool. Superman, she went legit and Superman gave her the Superman blue that's costume. That's cool. Which I thought I was enjoy really that nice. a lot. Yeah. She changed the S to an L, but yeah. But, but still, that's cool. Yeah. It that was, actually will make me look that up. It was a really nice little issue. Um, are there stories in here of note? There's a really good Calendar Man story from Christos Gage and Carl Moshert, where he gets a new psychiatrist at Arkham who's just like, oh, I don't care about your stupid holiday obsession. I want to get like a cool villain to like, like I sell a million copies of a book on. And it's just calendar man ruining that guy's life. Speaking of calendar man, this is the reason why I smiled just now, because I've been watching uh Harley Quinn on DC uh, streaming. Ooh. And the first part of this is basically Joker betraying her mm-hmm. and she ends up in prison and she always thinks that her snookums pudding is going to come get her and every time she has this you know oh my my man will come get me poison ivy goes hey calendar man how long has she been in here oh she's been for six months 32 days and four hours <laughs> <laughs> so good and then as soon as he says this because they're in a, a one of visitor's room she goes oh you can remember how long she's been in prison but you can't remember your own kid's birthday hey I'm a busy person in here <laughs> I love Calendar Man. Uh, I will go much into my love of of that show here when we get our new segment started up. And then uh, the the final couple stories I wanted to highlight in here. There's a excellent Gabriel Hardman Joker story that leads off leads off the whole book. Gabriel Mm -hmm. Hardman is a storyboard artist and he did Green Lantern Earth One, which is a really cool graphic novel. Came out a few years ago and it's actually getting a sequel next year. Ooh, fun. Uh, An excellent, excellent prankster story from Kurt Busiek and Dale Eaglesham. Kurt Busiek had, um, when he was working on Superman about 15 years ago at this point, he completely reinvented Prankster. So he's not just Diet Toy Man. He is a distractor for hire. Well, he will do a big public crime that's crazy over the top and get Superman distracted for like five, ten minutes on the other side of town. You can do whatever crime you want. Hence the word Prankster. Exactly. And it's well uh, done. And this is him like celebrating New Year's with his staff and being like, congratulations, everyone. We've done great work this year and then getting crashed by the Superman family. It's a really delightful little bit. That sounds like a good story. To yeah. Read. And Kurt Busiek made Prankster one of my favorite Superman villains. Like it's such a good take on a character that's I mean, at best, there's the classic. There's no law against putting pennies in my ear, Superman. <laughs> One of my favorite Bronze Age Superman issues involves a uh, prankster doing things that aren't technically illegal and making a big production out of it. But then Superman is like, oh, I looked in the books. It is illegal to put pennies in your ears in this state. And so he goes to bust him and people are like, hey, Superman, that's like, that's not cool. He's just mind his own business. We'll all put <laughs> pennies in our ears. Oh, it reminds me of, I remember an old uh, law I heard about in the state of Maine. You couldn't uh, go fishing off the back of a giraffe. 
It's very specific. I'm it's sure very specific. the prankster would have did it if he knew about it. And that just leads me to think that somebody in Maine had a giraffe and decided to get adventuresome with it. <laughs> Go fishing. I mean, you know, it's cheaper than gas for a boat. He's walking out into the middle. He's he still is breathing. a tall animal to ride. Exactly. That, that makes I'm sense. I'm sure like the like a giraffe probably fell or something. And then they were like, well, oh, I can't drown wanna... giraffes. That's, exactly. That's, that's animal cruelty. And. So we'll just have to get rid of the whole fishing yeah. element. I mean, people stop using zoo animals to go for fishing. And then uh, the final story in here is from one of my favorite recent art, uh, re, uh, re, ah, recent writers, mm-hmm. to, uh, Vita Ayala. They did uh, Morbius from a couple weeks ago that we absolutely we all loved. loved. And they do a really good Harley Renee Montoya team up. Oh, cool. Yeah. Really fun little story. Very touching. Not too much Harley, which is always a good thing in my book. Harley always needs a good balancing force, be it Poison Ivy or everyone's favorite cop turned vigilante, Renee Montoya. Indeed, indeed. So moving right along from this gigantic thing, uh, we're going to go into what we like to call we're the X-Men show. (laughs) (laughs) So we got X-Men, we got Marauders, we got Excalibur, and we'll talk a little bit about Power Rangers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But first off, X-Men 3. So we got... What, what, what effectively is the uh, botanical golden girls have yes. shown up <laughs> and they know how to use the portals from Kakoa. So mm-hmm. they're just doing it wherever they please. Yeah, they are genius botanists. They are. Oh, man. What was their name? Oh, it's horde culture. The horde Not culture. horticulture. Horde culture. Yeah, and when somebody said whore culture. I was like, now, now. <laughs> <laughs> not like not like this one pointing out to Emma Frost. This this S word who has P word issues. Yeah, they uh, they don't swear. <laughs> they just <laughs> they're very much old ladies. Yeah. We're talking hard candy. old they're, ladies. I think their ages are like 64, 68, 71. And then there's one that's like 89. One of them's really old. Yeah, the one that doesn't care about people at all. Exactly. Yeah. I loved on their uh, tech on the text page where it's uh, so and so's best friend. So and so's best friend. And Opal's thinks, best friend thinks, thinks that she's, she's Opal's best, best friend, friend, but isn't. <laughs> and then the last one goes, doesn't care for friends, isn't here for that. <laughs> but yeah, basically these uh, these old biddies have figured out how to get into Krakoa, and they're like, well, we we had a had our own world domination plan, and Krakoa kind of puts a wrench in that, so. We want to bring Earth back to a pristine way of going about that. And to do that, we need to kill about nine billion people. It's like, so just stay out of our way until we figure out a way to kill Krakoa. Bye. Who knew? Who knew that the Golden Girls were going to show up and try to ruin the world? I love all these wild, just one off. I I love the format of X-Men right now, where it's just these little one off stories that are building to a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And because you just get to see Buck Wild stuff like this. Speaking of Buck Wild stuff. Oh, I'm God. Uh, very glad that my my personal X Men ship Scott Summers and Emma Frost still alive and well, still alive and well. Emma gets to be part of the polycule. Yes, and I, I noticed that the, a little bit of uh, uh, Jean Grey and Emma Frost because they're still petty, but they're like they're civil. But they're civil. It's like we're we're going out for drinks after this, right? You're paying, and Emma Frost goes, "I always pay," <laughs> which <laughs> is preceded by. Gene complimenting Emma's shoes and Emma goes, oh, I'd let you borrow them, but I think they're a few sizes too small. <laughs> so and Gene fires back with, oh, I'm not much into borrowing. That's much more your thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I'm going to enjoy that if it keeps up. That's so good. Oh. And then. Uh, Sebastian Shaw. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about Sebastian Shaw before we go into Marauders, which is an all Shaw issue. Yes. Here he gets delightfully clowned on by horde culture where he's like let me handle this and tries to smooth talk these yeah, old ladies he pulls out the whole debonair uh elder statesman kind of thing and they just totally clown him yep they spray him with their power diffusing goo and then kick him while he's down <laughs> <laughs> poor sebastian shaw and we are going to get a little bit into sebastian shaw and marauders because man that was really his you know yeah what? let's just jump right in on that one as someone who has never particularly cared about the shaw family Mm-mm. since you made care about the Shaws. Shinobi Shaw. Right? Baby Shaw. I Baby Shaw, about. who apparently uh, killed himself in extraordinary fashion. Yeah. So he's got those uh, vision density like powers. Mm-hmm. And we get this just, we're going to have to show it because it's just so yeah, we, good. We're going to show here is what we <laughs> <It's> <laughs> basically ha- Shinobi fused his hand into his own just head. Just a haunting image of his skeleton with was the, oh. the bones are still in his skull. <laughs> God, that was intense. <laughs> but yeah, so here we see a uh, it's basically Shaw 
has put his son through the resurrection process, Mm -hmm. specifically making sure he doesn't remember when he died. He has him like mentally resurrected probably like a few months, a few years before that. Yeah. And he's always also kind of checking to see, is this the Snobby Shaw that's going to try to kill me? Yeah. You know, and well, you know, you did try to kill me, too. So he's it's basically (laughs) a whole issue of him buttering up his son and grooming him to be be the bishop, be his uh, black bishop. It starts off. He's wanting to put him as a as the red bishop. Not realizing that Kitty well, has. Well, he didn't really say it was going to be Red Bishop. I think he was trying to slide him as Red King. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and then once that uh, completely fell apart, <laughs> we'll see. And is here the cool thing about this is that this is a completely Sebastian Shaw issue. But as we'd already seen with Sebastian Shaw dealing with both uh, Kate Pride and dealing with Emma Frost. All the stuff he practically tells Shinobi is complete bullshit. Yeah, he is lying to him from from jump. Is is constantly lying to him, and and you can see him changing his game. Like in the middle of this, when he's got him in the red suit, he goes, "Oh, hey, by the way, we're gonna have to retailer you for black. Don't worry about it." <laughs> yeah, and he's like, "Oh, I thought it was gonna be Red King." Nope, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we're switching gears. He's just like selling him this lie of like, "Oh, and Emma came groveling for me to come back as Black King, and I'm it's... here to fix things." Oh no, by the way, don't worry about that red thing. Here's a new ship. It's like Shaw, you are here. <laughs> Here, purely because Xavier was like, oh, we need Sebastian Shaw and his wealth and influence, which I really love how this issue is setting up Shaw to be a major, major antagonist who wants to take over Krakoa economically. I think it's a really interesting way to tackle that instead of him just being like big, strong, bad guy. It's like, oh, no, he's an insidious force that is like slowly corrupting Krakoa. Yeah, I, I really think he could be a major player in the in the in the politics of this yeah. island. And I think that would be that's much more entertaining than watching him just kick the crap out of something. Exactly. And his kind of like big move towards that is his final lie to his son, mm-hmm. where he tells him that he, he admits that his son killed himself and tells Shinobi that he was conspired against by Emma and Kitty. Yeah. Got to push the right, push him right towards the people he doesn't like. I'm yeah, the very I, people that have been clowning on I, him. <laughs> I love, love, love this book. I'm really excited to see where it goes. Uh, I oh, there's a big major development in one of the text pages mm-hmm. where it reveals Kitty's pick for her red bishop is Bishop. It's Bishop. <laughs> How obvious! And Who, she's trying to convince if you'd look great in red. She goes, "No, I wouldn't." Come on, you. It's like. You finally get to be a bishop. You finally get to be a bishop. I already told you my answer was no. I had a conversation with friends a few months ago about how it's weird that Bishop has a chess name, but has never been involved with the organization in X-Men that is all chess names. Maybe it's just too much on the nose. Maybe. Now it really is. It is perfectly on the nose. It is perfectly on the nose. And let's see if he really does look good in red. We'll see. Yes. It'll look better than wearing that Gary Coleman outfit he's been rocking since 91. I have to say of all the new X-Men books, the, the adventuresome titles, you know, they, we've got like X-Force, we've got X-Men. We know those are going to go for the long haul. Mm-hmm. They've got good lineages and the X title sells. But when it comes to a book that's part of their grouping, but does it rock the X? Yeah. I think Marauders has got the the the, the best sea legs. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> See what I did there? No. <laughs> oh. I also like the little bit of uh, knowing, telling you where you are in continuity, but without like directly telling you mm-hmm. of ha- by having the freshly resurrected pyro. No, no tat- face tattoo. Just to like, hey. just to let you know, this is a flashback. <laughs> yeah, that's what I had. To, I had to sit and figure. It's like, oh, okay, this is way in the beginning because yeah. they did say that Pyro was the first to be resurrected, and that's the reason why they brought him out. Yeah, completely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. It's me, Pyro. <laughs> and for our last X book of the week, Excalibur. Yeah, uh, I got to say, you did uh, not enjoy this as much as I did. I didn't. And you know what? I think it has a lot to say because when you read a lot of comic books, a lot of it will stick with you. The mm-hmm. really good stuff sticks with you. But then sometimes you read a book and you realize all you've done is just turn pages. Everyone's fighting. It's done. That's what this bold book felt like to me. Ah, but there was so much in there. Now, granted, I, I I appreciate the fact that Richter has been brought yes, back. I really there's, like the stuff they're doing with Richter. There's something going on with uh, Apocalypse, but we kind of knew that was going to happen, and he's going to do something with Richter. But then the rest of this book was just Avalon this and Britain that and some pictures of uh, Brian chained up. I yeah. don't know why he's chained up, and now they're still fighting. And like... <sighs> yeah, I'm but not... Pete Wisdom showed up. Yes. Oh, <laughs> love... Level hot knives. Yeah. 
I'm I, yeah. The a lot of the Avalon stuff always gets a little kind of like confusing for me. I'm always like, eh, but I. Speed I don't really through. care much. I don't care about the Morgan Le Fay. I don't care about Merlin. I don't care about any of that crap. What I do care about is the mutants involved in Excalibur. And I noticed that they they in the back end of this book they list off you know the these these mutants might be a problem. And they list off all the original members of Excalibur. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll finally see Nightcrawler show up in an actually. Well, I know we. We're for sure getting Nightcrawler, I think, issue seven of X-Men. I think he has to because, honestly, he's not in any of these lineups. No, which is always surprising. That's very surprising. I, I'm always shocked by how underutilized Nightcrawler is. Nightcrawler has needed his own book. And the last Nightcrawler book that came out had art that was so good, I couldn't believe it. The Todd Nock one? Uh, the one where he's um, a pirate. Like the... The oh, old, no, no, the Dave, most, like the the old Dave Cockrum one? No, no, no. Oh, I'm getting confused by the Dave Cockrum cover we're talking about. Uh, but the most recent one where it went like 10 issues. Yeah, that issues. was the Claremont and Todd Knock one. Yeah. That so, one was really fun. So pretty. And I think Jamie McKelvey was on covers. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, I I even like the miniseries from when he was during the new X-Men era when he had like the little priest collar in his costume. Mm. Love that. Wish they bring that design element back. Oh, I didn't like that. I loved it. I liked the womanizing buccaneer nightcrawler. I didn't so much like the pious, having, I need to be a priest nightcrawler. Having recently watched Fleabag, I can confirm that you can both be a priest and be sexy. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally a character named Hot Priest on the show. Really? Yes, it's great. I've been wanting to see Fleabag ever since I saw it win the award. It's very short. It's very excellent. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Highly recommended. It, it's on my list of things to do. I, I really want to see that David Tennant... Um, Church, uh, Broad Church. Church. I haven't watched it. I've good. seen the first episode. It's a very serious thing, but as David Tennant is best. Yeah. Uh, he's not doing comedy, very straight face, but he's just killing it. Now, now let's be real. It's, it's no DuckTales. <laughs> it's no DuckTales. Sorry, duck, Brooke. No DuckTales. DuckTales 2017 does rule, however. Does it? Oh, it's so good. It does it have like a modified version of the theme song? Uh, yes. It also works the moon theme from the NES game as a plot point. The mo- Okay, now you're talking crap. I don't even know about Oh, man. So it's the the NES game has a very, very good chiptune song for the moon. It's pretty popular, like among DuckTales fans, and they work it into the show as a plot element. Mm-hmm. It's really, really good. Also, Jim Rash is on it. You know, I, I know that... Um, during that time, Disney was doing a lot of stuff with old DuckTales, Darkwing Duck, mm-hmm. and Tailspin. But I, uh, I launch think... Launch pads on the new DuckTales. I think that they're, the show they were doing that was like a vast departure on that is getting some word, and that's Gargoyles. Oh, yeah. People really going to bat for a Gargoyles revival. I've been seeing a lot of videos popping up. It's like, what's Gargoyles about? What's Gargoyles? About? I didn't watch a ton of it as a kid, but I liked it conceptually. And as an adult, I want to revisit it because I'm a huge, huge Star Trek Next Generation fan. Mm-hmm. And I know that like pretty much the entire cast of that show comes on because Jonathan Frakes voices the main villain. It was like, or something it was like, like mm. hey, LeVar, come, come down and record an episode. Hey, Michael, come on down. I and think the only is on it, too. I think the only guy they didn't get. I think I don't think Patrick Stewart was on the show. Mm-hmm. I sure think wasn't. he's the only main cast member, though, from Next Gen that didn't show up. Yeah, From what I'm understanding, though, the guy that created Gargoyles has been campaigning for a return. Yeah. Um, Greg Wiseman, who is also the creator of Young Justice and Spectacular Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Obviously got some phenomenal shows. Yeah. I'm hoping if Gargoyle gets revived, that means I can get my Spectacular season three. I just want Greenland, the animated series, to come back. That one was real good, too. I really loved Gone it. Gone too soon. It really was. We're dipping a little too early into our news section. <laughs> and now we're going to talk about the current crossover Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or is it Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers? Frankly, it should be called Go Go Ninja Go Go. Go Go Ninja Go Go. Um, I didn't read this, and I think this, ah, I don't really care for the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I like the turtles. I was not a ninja. I was neither a Ninja Turtles kid nor a Power Rangers kid. Same. I came into the turtles about the time I started working at a comic book store because I was like, oh, this seems like a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine recommended the currently running IEW series, which is excellent. Highly, highly recommend that book. It is of the turtle content I've consumed. It's the best. I have been. Um, my buddy Steve is a huge Ninja Turtles fan. He's mm-hmm. also, of course, one of the guys I play Hero Clicks with, and he has absolutely clowned me using the turtles and oh, Hero Clicks. Turtle pieces are real good. They are malicious, <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, check this out. I'm going to do this whole turtle power thing on you, and all four of them get involved. I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah, I got my I got my ass whipped. But uh, yeah, the first 
first issue, a lot of Power Rangers stuff in it, which I was like, eh, I, I've never cared for Power Rangers. No, con- no modern Power Rangers content has grabbed me. I checked out the current comic and I was like, eh, it's fine. I feel like you kind of have to have a childhood attachment to it to really get into it. Yeah. Nostalgia goes a long way. But it's a fun issue where uh, Tommy Oliver, the Green Ranger, and apparently everyone's favorite, is S- under sad to say yeah. is under the thumb of Shredder. We don't know how or why. It's this is one of those crossovers where it's a alt universe where the two coexist in the same universe and always have. Yeah, like, kind of like what happened back when Superman and Spider Man did the same yeah. thing in the seventies. The, the Turtles are aware of the Power Rangers because the Power Rangers are very public and visible the rangers are not familiar with the turtles they they assume the turtles are Rhea monsters which is very fun when donatello starts asking them the specifics about how things work like how does the green one play a flute with a metal faceplate? good point <laughs> i've always wanted that myself and billy quips that wow you are much smarter than most of the monsters we fight <laughs> So is this uh, the, the group, the Power Rangers, is this the um, Zach is the Black Ranger and Trinity yeah, is the Yellow Ranger this group? is the classic, like, Mighty the classic Morphin, lineup. Who, who are currently the stars of the Power Ranger comic. Oh, okay. so I don't know if this is in continuity with that. If it is, I assume it's with Gogo, which is like the flashback book. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was a fun little opening to a crossover. It wasn't my favorite thing I've read. But I, if I liked Power Rangers, I'd probably love it. And there's a show on Netflix called The Toys That Made Us. Yes. I have loved show. this show. And they, the recent se- uh, season has included not only an episode about Ninja Turtles, but also a Power Rangers. And I managed to get myself well educated on both toy lines. Yes. Uh, the, the Ninja Turtles was surprisingly touching getting to see the Eastman and Laird reunion. Yeah, because I didn't really know that they were as strange as they were. I knew that one of them had sold his stock yeah. in the show. And, and, and he did it at the worst possible time. Because you yeah. kind of lost out on like a hundred million dollars. Yeah, I know that East, Eastman's been uh, needing that turtle money for a while. Because that's why that's why I assumed he was always the more visible one. I didn't realize they had beef. Mm-hmm. And I knew Laird like made bank when they when he sold to Nickelodeon. Yeah, and, and then they would go back to him as like, and I really wish I was part of that. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I wish I was part of that hundred eighty one million dollars too, man. Yeah. Uh, that's but a hard it was really cool seeing them reu- reunite and they are actually having speaking of Ninja Turtles, uh, they're collaborating for the first time in years on a cover for number 100. I would love to see some old school uh, because I, I did actually enjoy the very, very beginning yeah, of Ninja Turtles. The Mirage stuff rules. Yeah. It's really good. During the, the red bandana years. Yes. I, I would have enjoyed that. Um, if you like that. St- oh. Just kind of, it's me trying to sell you on IDW Turtles. Okay. So the first arc, uh, Raphael is missing. It's just uh, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Mm-hmm. And they're all wearing red headbands in honor of Raph. Oh, that's a nice little so it's throwback. it's a really cool little, like, way of making that work. There's, um, when the Ninja Turtles came out in Hero Clicks, there was actually, um, like a... Uh, uh, a string of them, uh, like chase figures, they were completely black and white. Yeah, I remember. But they had the red bandanas. Yeah, it was really cool. I want those. There was a special a few years back. There was a crossover between the 04 Turtles, the uh, the 89 Cartoon Turtles, and the Mirage Turtles, where the Cartoon Turtles and the 04 Turtles constantly had to be like... Calm down, guys. Like, geez, we don't have to kill everyone. I know they're really. I mean, they <laughs> killed Shredder thirsty. in issue one. Yeah, decapitate him. Yeah, and then threw him a garbage, like some kind of grinder or a garbage bin or something like that. He had a rough time. Yeah, not a fun time for old shreds. Yeah, but uh, yeah, kind of just summarize. Uh, Power Rangers Team NT number one, perfectly good start to a crossover. If you like one or either properties, you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah. So, oh, uh, now I think we should take a little break before diving into those news because we've got a lot of news this time. We do have a lot of news. Hey everybody, this is Brooke with Haphazard Fiction Studios and welcome to episode 15. We are officially teenage drivers in driver's ed right now, so if you're on the roads, watch out. If you didn't notice, we did take off last week, uh, but welcome back with us this week. You know, We wanted to make sure the guys had an opportunity to uh, spend the Thanksgiving holiday with their families. And if you would like to become part of our family, you know, there are a couple of ways for you to do that. Uh, number one, you can join us on Patreon and become a patron. You know, just a couple bucks a month can help us and goes a long way with us. 
Um, but even easier, if you if you don't have the opportunity to do that, you know, throw us a subscribe, throw us a like on YouTube, you know, give us some comments. Anything that you can do to help us get better is going to be very appreciated. But uh, once again, welcome back from our break, and I take you back now to Casey and Gideon with Hazardous Materials. And welcome back. Uh, first first item on the docket is uh, the Black Widow trailer. The Black Widow trailer. Ups and lows. It looked looked better than I thought it would, except for one thing. Taskmaster. God, the costume's awful. Jeez. It looks terrible. It he looks does. worse every time they show more of it. I know. I, I've, I've, I've scanned through this trailer because Taskmaster is one of my all-time favorite mm-hmm. characters. I needed this to work for me because this is the MCU. This is the Pro Bowl. Yeah. And, and then he shows up wearing... A Power Rangers helmet. He he looks like a bad CSGO skin. Yeah. I mean, I can see where they were trying to go because I, I looked at some of the stills for this and the, the bottom part of the skull is there. But the it's, ski goggles. And the skull is so faint. Yeah, very faint. Like, it's like gunmetal on black, so you can barely see it. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this thing. And um, Everything I've seen, every promotional image, even even back to uh, behind the scenes image, mm-hmm. it's all the same scene, which was him riding the tank and firing the arrow. We, we have no other footage anywhere. We got that concept art that was the initial reveal of mm-hmm. him like doing some kung fu fighting against Widow. Yeah, and even then, the costume just looks bland as hell. And it it really stupid does. Sunglasses over the mask. Like Th- this is gonna be one of those things where I really hope that function defeats form. That even though he looks the way he does. That visually he comes off as eye catching. I, I'm really hoping they keep his personality. That's the biggest thing I'm worried about. Is he's not going to be the. You think he's going to be one of the silent villains? Uh, I'm going to be really pissed if he is, and I think he's going to be. Yeah, I think mean, he's going to be like going to be a Russian version of a Taskmaster. Although, that said, Red Guardian is delightful, and so that gives me a <laughs> bit more hope for having Taskmaster's tone right. Oh, well, I, I I love the guy playing Red Guardian, and I just I think he's uh, he's a better Red Guardian than he is a Hellboy. I can't I can't <laughs> believe the Russians captured Hopper and then turned him into a super soldier. Oh my god, I didn't even realize that. That's a T-shirt right there from Stranger Things to Red Guardian. This is what they did to our sheriff. He had to suffer through Hellboy to get there, but he did. now he's in fighting shape. Now he's the MCU. He's got a cool mask. He's got a good outfit, which he still fits in. But. Damn, Taskmaster. Come yeah. on. And then talking just about the trailer itself, I mean, it was fine. It looked, I'm not a big Black Widow fan, so it looked fine. Yes, and and I talked I talked to you about this right before we got started, mm-hmm. that I had read an article where somebody was uh, trying to piece together or piece apart the, the trailer, and they said, you know, there's something about this trailer that just seems a little off. Uh, it, it seems unusual that Marvel would go to the well, create a, a, this big movie, about a character that they killed off, just <laughs> spoilers for Endgame, by the way, that they killed off in Endgame. And I mean, is the movie really going to have any consequences? Mm-hmm. And that's what I think it is. I think this movie is going to have some consequences, and they've been hiding that. Um, Marvel is not a stranger to deceptive marketing, as we've seen when a, a Hulk was running with the crew in, uh, in Infinity, Infinity War. War. Yeah. And in some of the back shots where they changed the type of Black Widow that was behind Steve Rogers in the Endgame. Uh, mm-hmm. and, um, Marvel is all about, we're going to sell this to you. And oh, by the way, here's what's really going on. We're going to kind of <laughs> screw with you. Because when Endgame happened and it, they, they did that slow reveal of five years later, my audience collectively gasped. That was a surprise. I did not see mm-hmm. coming. No one saw that coming. I think that we're going to get something Black Widow. I think that Black Widow is actually going to be more relevant than we think it's actually going to be. Interesting. So I'm wondering, does that mean we're going to have a Black Widow 2? Does Electric that mean Boogaloo. that Natalia Romanoff is pulling a Marvel Comics and, hey, by the way, I didn't die. I'm really alive. I mean, she's done this recently. Yeah, I figured they were just going to be setting up Yelena Belanova to be a new Black Widow, which is whatever. It's another character I don't particularly care for. I mean, when it really comes to it, um, Red Skull said, you know, you take this stone and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. But then they went back and pulled the old Captain America and he's got the stone. So. There's a, little bit great, there's a little bit of give there. There's we'll a little see. bit of give there. And that's what I'm saying. I think that 
I think that uh, Scarlett Johansson is actually being a little deceptive yeah. in her marketing. Honestly, I almost hope I, I kind of hope that you're wrong and we just have a simple standalone movie. It's because let's be honest, the the Marvel movies are a little up their own ass. Like, you know what? And you think that the there's, continuity alone. Remember when we thought that Ant Man was going to be a nice standalone movie and it became the lock and key of resolving Endgame? Yeah, but I think that was just a stinger, <laughs> though. Like you know. I mean, like you can watch Ant-Man and the Wasp in a vacuum and still enjoy it. You can. And you probably could watch uh, Black Widow in a vacuum as well. But yeah. I think it's going to have long term consequences. We'll, we'll see. Hope, uh, I hope so, because I like I like surprises like yeah, this. We'll, we'll see. I, I'm kind of a two minds. On the one hand, I'm like, I want it to count in this like gigantic Uber narrative that's been going. Another time I was, on the other hand, I'm kind of like, well, I kind of get a little tired of that. We just... Far, my one of the biggest issues was Far From Home, and it was way too preoccupied with what other movies were doing to the detriment of the movie itself. I was actually going to bring up Far From Home because, I mean, in the very end, you got two things, you know, Peter getting his identity revealed and, you know, boom, <laughs> Nick Fury is hanging out with scrolls in the like, middle of space. Just just give me a movie that I that I can throw on on FX on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century. Marvel has found lightning in a bottle and it knows how to use it <laughs> constantly. The MC Ouroboros. Yes. Uh, I, 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 hate, I don't hate to say it. I love to say it. I'm living in an age where Marvel's movies just keep hitting it out of the park I, every single time. And I, st- I, I still love all the movies. It's just, well, so, most of the movies. I didn't care for Far From Home. But I just, I don't know. Philistine. I feel like at a certain point, you're going to start seeing diminishing returns on demanding an audience be familiar with a franchise that's over 10 years old at this point, you know? Yeah. Oh, interesting news. And I didn't put this on our, our schedule, but it uh, has been confirmed that uh, Jeffrey Renner uh, is doing the Hawkeye series. And then that's it for him. Jeremy Renner. I mean, that makes sense. Guys. Yeah. He is pretty much passing the baton to he, Kate he's, Bishop. He's getting up there, so. Well, the, the, the Marvel is also apparently a little concerned or apparently... Uh, possibly concerned of some uh, press that came out about Jeffrey Renner and the treatment of yeah, his ex-wife. Jer- Jeremy Renner's been, he has been riding a bad press train for the past year between yeah. his stupid social media app and then all of the, this very, very ugly, is it an ongoing divorce or is it just? Yeah, well, she's an ex-wife, but I don't know if you've ever seen Jeffrey Renner in interviews. He can be a little problematic. Yeah, Jeremy Renner can be. He can sometimes completely kill a vibe. He, he is a professional buzz killer. Yeah, I, I saw there, there's apparently a YouTube interviewer where basically he takes people out for pizza and then interviews them. And mm-hmm. he interviewed all the, the Avengers, you know, the big guys. Mm-hmm. And everybody was on board eating all this pizza and having fun. There's Jerry Renner. D- uh, just completely resolved to be the buzz kill of this, to be, the, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're asking me. What are you asking me this question? This is a stupid question. Just determined to ruin the entire uh, thing. Obnoxious. And I was like, which, okay, she, I guess that's what that's the Renner we're dealing with. Because Hawkeye's my favorite Avenger. And I and I like Jeremy Renner's performances. Like yeah, they've I been too. solid. When he when he actually gets something to do, he's been good. Yeah. I, I guess it just depends on which Renner we're getting. Are we getting the cool Renner who enjoys his interview or the bad Renner who's just irritated to be there <laughs> and wants you to know about it? Well, Either way, we won't deal with it for long. No, no, we won't. Uh, moving on, we've got uh, clarification. Do, huh? Lucy, do you want to do uh, save the comic news for the end and kind of just go through some of the trailer stuff that we have? Let's kind of keep them bunched together. Yeah, I guess we could do that. Yeah, I just uh, realized so do, uh, our schedule's like that doesn't make a lot of sense for the way that's the way plotted we out. Jump trails. You want to talk about a little about the the Ghostbusters thing? Up, comp- yeah, up, it looks really cool. Oh uh, yeah, some new images of the Ghostbusters, including the new poster, which we see right here, which we got our Ecto one carving it through a wheat field. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Where is it going? It, rural ghosts. Yes, rural ghosts. Apparently, they've seen there's there's a mountaintop in the background with a lightning strike happening. So are we seeing like some crazy ghoster type stuff going on? That could be fun. That would be kind of cool. Um, we're also finding out. Um, the the studio is is all but confirmed. Well, they haven't all but confirmed. But they have confirmed that the family involved is the uh, daughter and grandchildren of one of the Ghostbusters. Which I'm willing to bet dollars to pesos right here that's Egon. Yeah, Egon does fuck so he does. I mean, he, <laughs> clores, he collects spores, molds, and fungus. But they said that er, early on that we are definitely going to. Uh, speak on uh, his legacy. Okay. So, and, and I'm all about that because he was my favorite of yeah. the four. Same. And I'm really, I'm excited to see Egon's family because apparently the little girl is a science nerd and the boy is kind of a, a gearhead, kind of like the way that uh, Ray was. That's fun. Yeah. 
So I'm excited. We also got to see this really cool picture of uh, our boy Ant-Man holding a trap. <laughs> An ant trap. An ant trap. Uh, I, I'm hoping that this opportunity gives him a, another chance to be on... Uh, uh, and Conan, Conan O'Brien. And play, and play Mac and me. <laughs> he just pulled the Mac and me stunt again just recently. Ah, wonderful. It was great because <laughs> he did it twice <laughs> in one year. It's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I probably shouldn't just play the real stuff. And he played it again. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to something that has a trailer this week. Which I did not expect at all. The Boys season two. Uh, that was really a real quick turnaround. I, I was going to say it's like I expected at least another six months on yeah. that one. You could see a guy's head get torn in half. Uh, good it was time, pretty good time, metal. Good yeah, it was very metal. Um, this whole season is probably going to be just as great as the first yeah, one was. I was very pleasantly surprised by the first season as someone who did not care for the comic at all. The book or the show pretty much fixed every single problem I had with the book. Really? I enjoyed the comic. I didn't like the way it ended. Yeah, just the comic just felt really shallow and not thought out while the show is very much about giving things extra depth and making characters, not just caricatures. I well, don't th- I don't think we're going to get the French origin where he is a unicyclist who joust with baguettes. No, no. And and God, I really hope we don't get the ending that they had in the boys, which we're not going to get into. Um, however, you know, what? enough time has passed on uh, the movie I want to bring up and enough time on the old boys. Um, I want to talk about my favorite effect, which happened in the last episode of the boys, mm-hmm. uh, where he used a uh, point blank heat vision and burned oh, the skull in. Oh my God. That was, that was glorious. Now this has been done also in uh Brightburn. Is that the name of it? Is yeah. It? I didn't go see that one. I did. I enjoyed it. And he did the same stunt to his dad, but went through his skull. Ugh. I was like, within like one year, we got two gory heat vision deaths. <laughs> heat vision. It's the hot new thing. It is the hot new thing. And if you, if you do, if you want to make a, a nice scene, burn out your lover or your father's face out, that's the power you use. Give him the hot pocket treatment. <laughs> oh, hot pockets will never not hurt you coming into <laughs> the world. Ah, uh, yes. My frozen hot pocket. Now it's cooked. Now I'll enjoy it. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> and so... We've got a couple of uh, new big comic announcements for this week. We do. Apparently, X Classified, uh, which had uh, our boy Havoc in, mm-hmm. has turned into Hellions. Yes. Which, um, <sighs> ups and lows I have opinions on. <laughs> okay, Mr. Sinister, I'm all about anything that Mr. Sinister is involved yes. in. Totally cool. Uh, Hellion from the Hell. No, no, not Hellion. It was uh, Empath from the Hellions. Yeah, Empath. Who had a relationship with Magma, but now they're not sure if it was really a relationship or he manipulated her. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But he was, he's, it turns he's, out he was really in love with her. He's still wearing that uh, Mirror Universe Star Trek outfit. He's, really, the Hellions he's wearing wore. the old Hellion uh, trainer uniform. I was like, okay, I guess somebody's got to wear that ugly ass outfit. Uh, who else we got? We got uh, Quanin. Mm-hmm. Uh, eh. My, my interest in her waned from Fallen Angels. Maybe this writing will improve. Whoever is writing this is clearly not writing Fallen Angels. I mean, I've never really cared about Psylocke outside of like pre Ninja Betsy. So I, I've, 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 I've been interested to see what the new take would be. Mm-hmm. And if Fallen Angels is a new take, I'm, I'm not interested. It's like, oh boy, another boring ninja assassin. Yeah, without Just all the I... cool backstory, yeah. all you are is a hand ninja that yep. Bat- Betsy Braddock jumped into, and that's uh, Diet Electra. Yeah, who else we got on this one? We got uh, we got Nanny and Orphan Maker, who I wow. haven't seen in years. I haven't seen them since X Factor. Yeah. Uh, we got uh, diet. Sa- don't we got diet diet yes. saber You get the sidekick to the spinoff of saber tooth. It's wild child, of course. Uh, I guess that's what you got to do when you put the freaking A lister in a pit. I'm always gonna be bitter about that. Getting, he will you not. Know this. He will not get to come out of the pit until he has behaved. Uh, that's the sad part. He, wild child will continue until morale improves. He is baby in a corner right now. That that makes me really sad. <laughs> I hope that when he comes out, he gets a cool. Uh, I'm not going to go into my fanboy diatribe about why he's supposed to be in this book, but apparently we need a claw boy. We don't have Feral, thank God, but we do have this. And rounding out the team, former Marauder Scalp Hunter, which makes me the winner of our Nasty Boys and Marauders uh, bet. I can't believe this. I mean, I, <laughs> I can believe it, but thank there's your you. goddamn dollar. What I think is kind of funny is that we've got 
Sinister in a book with the name of Emma Frost's former team and Emma Frost in a book with the name of Sinister's former team. That is a good point. Yeah, because Emma's out. in Marauders and Sinister is in Hellions. Huh. I'm kind of curious to see uh, our, our boy, uh, uh, Scott Butter, how he's going to deal with his old boss being there. Yeah, I can't imagine he'll be too pleased about it. No. And this is not going to be a clone. This is going to be like the original. Because yeah. that, that's we're getting the fresh slate. So that means all the Marauders are in their original bodies. Or is it one of the clones resurrected? <laughs> oh, because they said they would get the best version of that person. Oh. So they are being very selective. So what's the they... best version of him? Is it the one from Mutant Massacre or the one in the like scuffle right before Inferno? I think the best version of Grey Crow is going to be from the Gambit book where okay. he helped uh, him find uh, where Sinister was cloning the others. Because there was a part where um, uh, John Grey Crow is scalp So we're going to be using names intermittently. Um, but Grey Crow retired from his stuff, trying to get away from his past being uh, Sinister's lackey. And he was like a cook in like some diner out in the middle of nowhere. And Gamb had to go and find him. It's like, I need you to help me find Sinister's place. You're the only one that's got the passwords and all this other stuff. So instead of like building like his little Lego guns, he's like building Lego fryers. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the whole story actually also played out the idea that Sabretooth had never been cloned by Sinister because it kept screwing up. It just couldn't happen. So when they go into uh, to the, the, the cloning vats that uh, Grey Crow is guiding him to, mm -hmm. they find a, a Sabretooth clone in there that was uh, incomplete. And it was just like just drooling and and like half parts of it missing. And it wasn't thinking straight. It's just a bad bake. Just a bad bake. Got a got a soggy bottom. So I think that's what we're dealing with. I think that we're dealing with the slightly reluctant murderer because you got okay. to. Yeah, that makes an interesting angle. And uh I like the creative team. I love Zeb Wells. He's one of my favorite Marvel writers of the modern age. And Steven Segovia, I haven't read any of his stuff, but every time I see his art, I'm like, oh, that looks really nice. Yeah. I'm curious to see where this goes. I mean, I've never seen a dynamic like this. Yeah. So where's it going to go? What's their point? What's and, their mission status? I mean, it's an X title. We're going to buy it. Of course we're going to buy it. <laughs> I'm thinking that, that Havoc's going to be the straight man. And I, I think that he's probably included in this motley group of complete bastards. Because uh, during the Axis inversion that turned Sabretooth good, it turned Havoc bad. Mm -hmm. And it turned him real bad. I mean, he was bad, bad. Was, he had an evil scar. just to Yeah, he had the evil Havoc scar. And, and he had like a, apparently a, a hang up with uh, Wasp because as far as he was concerned, there was this reality where he was Wasp's husband and they had a child together. And that was taken away from him. And he yeah. was heavily mentally I, uh, scarred. I hated Uncanny Avengers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not care for that book one bit. No, I didn't like the way they were dealing with Havoc at that time. Yeah. And I just kind of checked out. Yeah. Havoc summer, uh, not Havoc summer. Jeez. Alex summers being like the poster child of, uh, respectability politics. I was just like, well, this is stupid. It, it, it seemed to and me that, like they didn't well, really make call, him just evil. call me Alex. I don't think I'd ever rolled my eyes so hard at a scene. <laughs> he was just selfish. Yeah. He was exceedingly selfish. Uh, a bit more uh, sinister than, I guess, the superior Iron Man was. Mm -hmm. The superior Iron Man was just a hedonist. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like the worst version of that. It was pure Tony Stark. Yeah. If Tony Stark had like zero morals at all. I, by the way, I love superior Iron Man. Yeah. And if you can get your chance to read that on a trade, it had the best armor suit as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And so, I, I think I think I've even brought this up in a previous episode because I was referring to Iron Man the, book of the decade, the iPod armor. Yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> so pretty. All right. Moving on. Uh, what do we got here? The oh, last comic announcement. Strange Academy. Yeah, it is uh, Marvel Hogwarts. It's all of their premier magic users teaching the next generation of wizards. Yeah. All you had to say was Marvel Hogwarts. I've got goosebumps on my back. <laughs> I say we're going to buy the crap out of this damn book. All right. So <laughs> rapid fire. Before we have to wrap things up. All right. What houses are Marvel characters going to be in? Okay. So Brother Voodoo, thinking he's a Gryffindor. That's a Gryffindor straight yeah. up. Gryffindor. Yep. Wanda Maximoff. I Ravenclaw. Wanna... Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Um, I was kind of leaning towards Gryffindor. Eh, she's a little shady. Uh, my boy Damien Hellstrom, obviously a Slytherin. Very, very much I mean, a not just because he's son of the devil, but also he's a pretty cunning, ambitious guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's He doesn't really have a... His morality skill has been kind of grayed out lately. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's, he's by and large will help you do something, but he will help you do it his way. Now, I feel like the obvious thing is, oh, Stephen Strange, Ravenclaw. 
I would argue he's a Slytherin. I, I think his cunning and ambition is much more important to the character than his book smarts. You think so? Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, guy shows up and just claws his way to being Sorcerer Supreme. And he has done some other slightly shady stuff, like when he relied on weapons for a while or when he didn't have the amulet and he relied on black yeah. magic. And I think a lot of the reason he's Sorcerer Supreme is that he's able to think around problems instead of thinking through problems. Rook, I feel like you should be in this shot with us talking Doctor Strange. <laughs> you, you should come over here and talk Doctor Strange with us. <laughs> uh, now, but yeah, I mean, he had uh, but he was doing black magic. Um, if I'm not mistaken, what, what was the name of the amulet he was using when he was doing uh, it was that square one. Had an eye in it. It wasn't the eye of Agamotto. It was like it was the amulet of Agamotto. It was the amulet. Apparently, that's a big difference. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, Doctor Doom, post travel Slytherin. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. He's probably running the show. Wiccan, Hufflepuff. Yes, I believe he, he probably even has a Hufflepuff mug in one of the in one of the Young Avengers yes. books. Uh, what is your house? You're a Slytherin. I'm right? a Slytherin. I'm a Hufflepuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I will be friendly to you while you're stabbing me in the back. It's okay. <laughs> so what what else do we have on this? Magic? Slytherin. Magic, yeah. Definitely Slytherin. A lot of Marvel Slytherins. A lot of Marvel Slytherins. Cunning and ambition is a pretty common. I think the Belasco is really show, uh, running the whole uh, Slytherin That'd thing. That'd be fun. I would love Belasco oh, to come back. I want to see him chomping his little stogie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's Sim. Sim, sorry. Belasco is the one with red uh, with one that's army's right. red. The guy became the techno-organic guy during Inferno. Yeah, he was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, magic's uh, mentor and then yeah. sim was like his uh, major domo his uh sidekick and he had that little black vest on his yeah, huge body his, the cigar yeah i remember that i didn't like him when he was techno though i my favorite one of my favorite scenes in inferno is when he turns he gets techno and bobby's like i got this and he freezes him and he's like now my processing works even faster because computers overheat like some quality claremontian science i did not like techno organic sim at all and it was it was done so i think it was the fact that 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 he was drawn in that um wow by that new mutants artist i really hated that was drawing the title run doug ramsey got shot oh the my, bird boy issues yeah i i know who you're talking about i love that guy i hate that guy i i love his stuff i hate his stuff it's very like <laughs> it's very elf quest Oh, no, no. Take that back, sir. That is a sin. Hey, there is a lot of <laughs> there's similarities. Nothing, there's nothing windy penny about that nightmare. Oh, they've got those big old cartoony eyes. I don't and think he's got that kind of broken bones kind of look to him. Yeah, everyone's very like. Very fragile looking. Yeah, I didn't it's, like that. It's very cartoony. It's very Disney. Um, uh, my, well, and I mean like for classic a second, like, I actually 30s remembered, Disney. I, for a moment, I remembered his name and then it eluded me. Just it's something with an S, right? Oh, I forget. Oh, this is going to drive me nuts. Uh. Oh, well, anyway. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on from that old, that old I know, business. Man, can't believe this. Something that Casey hates that Gideon likes. A shocking <laughs> development on his materials. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I actually, I was, I was watching something on YouTube and I, I wanted to bring this up because it's Sinkevich. Do you remember the toy line in the 80s, Star Yours? No. Uh, this is a, uh, you heard of Zoids? Yeah, and I'm familiar. Zoids. Okay, so back in the 80s, they were trying to repackage certain Zoid-esque kind of things mm-hmm. into like an action figure series. So like there were these wind up, they had little wind up motors in them and they had like their chest would like do laser things yeah. or like a, a ratchet or something like that. Um, but Marvel did a series to promote this, kind of like the, what they did with Transformers. It was a four issue series and all of the covers were Sankevich covers. Nice. Yeah, well, not so much. This toy line only lasted for one year because it failed miserably. Oh, and no. apparently, this is the quality of Sinkevich. <laughs> he killed that toy line. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can understand that because Bill Sinkevich is not an artist you would want to sell toys. No, I mean, who, wh- who thought this? Like, you know what? I need something bright and nice and clean. I'm going to sell these toys. Let's get the moody arts of Bill Sinkevich. <laughs> yeah. The guy who made Warlock, the character that's impossible to translate into 3D. Oh, my God. Brett Blevins. Brett Blevins is the artist. Yes, Brett of. Blevins. I hope that he stubs his toe right now. <laughs> I hope that somewhere somebody has told him, hey, Brett, no one likes you. Uh, and he stubs his toe when it happens. Brett Blevins is beloved. He is great. <laughs> I love those Inferno issues of New and, Mutants. And I hope that when he stubs his toe, he dumps his hot coffee all over Vendetti. See, how can you say that? <laughs> 
I mean, Vendetti, Vendetti's got it coming, but. He definitely got it coming. He definitely has at least one hot coffee the coming. The issue where Warlock has to learn about death by carrying around Cypher's corpse. Oh, oh I mean, this one? Yeah. That one? An all-time great New Mutants issue. That was that was kind of dark. Lu- yeah, Louis Simonson and Brett Belvin, like, Brett Belvin. But I hated Bird Boy close. so much. Yeah, Bird Brain sucked. I'll give you that. And I remember when I was reading Fall of the Mutants and I was just like, oh, this is kind of slow. Oh, shit. Doug just died. Yeah. Like, uh, that came out of nowhere. And I was I was a uh, I was a kid when that happened. Oh, and my, my new mutants was my new mutants. And even though I hated the art, I still read every single issue that came out up until when <laughs> Leafoid, I'm Leaf, Leafoid, Lifefield took over. I am still done with how much you hate Wilson Cabbage and Brett Blevins that you stuck with that book. That's that's a testament to how much you loved it. I know. See, I was like, God, this is so awful. But these are my characters. These are my boys. I have to stick it out. And I hated it. You you will get cultured if you like it or not. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, nothing. Uh, nothing is better than McLeod. The fine 17 issues are just golden. It's like I love this man so much. He's on my Facebook. <laughs> I McLeod's good. Geis is fine. But mm-hmm. I mean, come on, some cabbage and blevins is where it's at. Oh. <laughs> this is the great divide. But uh, we should probably looping back around before we wrap things up on Strange Academy. Uh, being written by Scotty Young, mm-hmm. who has been doing Middle West over at Image, which has been. Wait a, a minute, is this the same Scotty Young that does that super deformed uh, art style? Yeah. What's he doing writing? He's been writing for a few years now. Huh. He wrote and drew I Hate Fairyland at Image. He wrote <laughs> a Rocket Raccoon solo series. Uh, he wrote Deadpool recently, and now he's doing Strange Academy, and Humberto Ramos is going to be on art. Huh. Yeah, it's, I'm like, man, Ramos doing non-Spider-Man stuff. Right? I, he's done fairy tale stuff before, so this should be interesting. Hmm. Well, I'm excited to see where this whole Strange Academy is. I really does do hope it goes the Hogwarts angle. Oh, and it's it got does to. It, I, I hope that is a little uh, tongue in cheek and I hope it's a nice clean art style so I can distinctly see what the hell's going on. It doesn't get too moody uh, like the way Strike Force apparently has been going. Mm. <sighs> I haven't been reading it, so I can't speak to it. I Well, I've been reading it because Spider-Woman is in it mm-hmm. and Spider-Woman is like one of my top three. She's getting a new book. She is getting a new book and I'm super excited about it because they're going back to her, her uh, costume. Bad column. I love her current costume. I don't. I love the jacket and shades. I hate it. I think they look cool as hell. No, hate it. But then I guess I'm also stung by the nostalgia bug because I read Spider-Woman comics when I was very young. Um, I used to find old uh, old issues in uh, antique uh, sh- uh, shops, apparently. Um, I remember my dad would go and look at like antique mm-hmm. light fixtures and old radios. And he goes, I want you to go, go read, look at those comics. And I'd be looking at like, you know, Werewolf by Night versus Spider Woman. Yeah. Spider Woman versus Necra and the Mandrill and all the Daddy Long Legs and the uh, whatever horror theme that they were going to mm-hmm. go. Cause that's what Spider Woman was. She was a yeah. horror book. And so I, that's the costume I, I've always seen her in. I, that's the costume I want. Here's my, one reason the Jack costume is better has a spider logo instead of a yellow coochie arrow logo. That's true. <laughs> it really depends on who's writing it. Sometimes it's an arrow pointing towards it. Sometimes it's kind of a wrap around. It becomes almost like a bikini bottom kind yeah. of thing, but it was always meant to be just a, a diamond pattern on her chest. Um, I didn't like it because the glasses were stupid. Glasses were cool. Glasses were stupid. Glasses cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want her to wear glasses. I want her to wear a mask. I want her. I want the bright reds. Can we have the jacket with a mask? Yes. Cool. We will compromise. Okay. All righty. And with that, uh, I think it's going to wrap it up for this. Yeah, week. I think that's what we got. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, this is uh, issue 15. Not issue. Yeah, it's issue 15. This is our 15th issue. Um, so uh, we're still trying to get in a whole uh, YouTube thing, trying to get things. So obviously, every episode we try to do something new. Um, something is more improved. Our production values, as you can see, I got this really cool background behind me instead of a window. Wow. No window for me anymore. That's kind of cool. I'm sure that came from whatever no more glare nickels or dimes that we've been milking out of our Patreon thing. But yeah, we still got a Patreon site that needs you. Um, if you're, Hey, if you're even a friend of mine, you like me, get on my Patreon and give me some money. If you're a friend of Gideon, throw him Where's some money, my money, honey. Yeah. Cause we, we definitely want to make the production values of these even more better, even more better. Um, Extra most bestest. Yeah. I think our current project right now is we want to get uh, a camera right here. So that we can actually do uh, my 
like games and stuff like that. Yeah. You can actually follow it. But to do that, we need a nice new camera. So help us become legitimate. Uh, check us out on uh, our, well, we got we got a Twitter. I guess we got a Twitter. Yeah, we have an Insta. We got we have an Instagram. Um, and we, we got have a Patreon. A Patreon. We do have a Patreon, which we um, we're going to really talk about that until Kyle's come home. Uh, give us a like if you like us. Uh, hit the bell if you want to see new episodes. Our all episodes do land every Tuesday, every each week. Well, of course, it's a holiday. Comment if you have any questions or requests of an issue you want to see us talk about. Yeah, and with that, I think that uh, that just about does it. Yeah, see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>